close together to hear your word. Pray for eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts and minds that can understand so that we may be pleasing to you and do what is right in your sight. Thank you for gathering us together today and for all your blessings. We pray that you will be with us this evening and we love you. Shem Yehoshua HaMashiach, in Jesus' name, Amen. All right, so we'll just start reading. Uh, I'll read chapter 40 and then we'll go into it. Genesis chapter 40. It came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them. So they were in custody for a while. Then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, had a dream, both of them, each man's dream in one night, and each man's dream with its own interpretation. And Joseph came into them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. So he asked Pharaoh's officers, who were with him in the custody of his lord's house, saying, Why do you look so sad today? And they said to him, We each have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. Then the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, Behold, in my dream, a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches. It was as though it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Now within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler. But remember me when it is well with you and please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For indeed, I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews. And also I have done nothing here that they should put me into the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also was in my dream, and there were three white baskets on my head. In the uppermost, ba uppermost basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. So Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation of it. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh from you. Now it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he had made a feast for all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and the chief baker among his servants. Then he restored the chief butler to his butlership again, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to him. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. In order to better understand the details of this chapter, we'd like to first take a deeper look at the messianic connection to Joseph's role in the prison house, as it relates to the purpose of Messiah's first coming. As a result, we're going to have to break this chapter into parts. Today, we're going to begin looking at the shadow picture of the life of Joseph that Yehoshua Messiah fulfills in relation to this chapter, and later we will focus more on the details of the chapter itself. Before we begin, there are a couple things we'd like you to make note of from our reading. The butler and baker were imprisoned for sin. In the beginning of this chapter, we're told that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt were in prison because they offended their lord. In Hebrew, the word offended is chata, which is the Hebrew word for sin. So the butler and the baker were put into prison because they sinned against their lord, which means they broke the law of their lord. Also, Joseph was sitting with and ministering to these sinners. We're also told that the captain of the guard charged Joseph in the prison house with these two men, and that he served them. This Hebrew word for served is sharath, and also means to minister to. In fact, this is the same Hebrew word used to describe the Levite priests, priests who minister to the congregation of Israel. So Joseph was an innocent man who was imprisoned among those who had sinned against their Lord, and he sat with these sinners, serving and ministering to them in the prison house. We can clearly see our Messiah here. He was sent in the flesh to dwell among us and minister to us. 
We all have sinned against our Lord, yet he came to us where we were. He sat with us, sinners, in order to minister to us in our spiritual prison house of sin, which if we remain in will lead to our death. Matthew 9, verse 10. Now it happened as Jehoshua sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Yahushua heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. We're going to begin this study by discussing what some of our Jewish brethren believe about the Messiah. Traditional Judaism describes the Messiah by giving him two names for the two manifestations or two personas represented by two biblical figures. Like us, they see the messianic prophecy in the scriptures surrounding these two biblical figures. The Jewish writings called the Talmud documents these two messianic figures to be Joseph and King David. And the names they have given these two messiahs are Moshiach ben Yosef, Messiah, son of Joseph, and Moshiach ben David, Messiah, son of David. In fact, their writings specifically state that Moshiach ben Yosef will come before Moshiach ben David. So if I could, I don't know if you're going to touch on this, but um, these Talmud uh, writings are based off of rabbis' interpretations of the scripture. So they're not just pulling this out of the air. They're getting this picture of uh, Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David from, as she pointed out, the prophecies. And we're going to look at a lot of them today. Just it's, it's really not much different than what we're doing, is seeing the Messiah in the scriptures. All right, so the following excerpt is from a well-known traditional Jewish website called Chabad.org. And this is called Mashiach 101, Appendix 2. Jewish tradition speaks of two redeemers, each one called Mashiach. Both are involved in ushering in the messianic era. era. <laughs> Sorry. There are Mashiach ben David and Mashiach ben Yosef. The term Mashiach, unqualified, always referred to, refers to Mashiach ben David, Mashiach, the descendant of David, of the tribe of Judah. He is the actual final redeemer who shall rule in the messianic age. Mashiach ben Yosef, Mashiach, the descendant of Joseph, of the tribe of Ephraim, son of Joseph, is also referred to as Mashiach ben Ephraim, Mashiach, the descendant of Ephraim. He will come first, before the final Redeemer, and later will serve as his Viceroy. The essential task of Mashiach ben Yosef is to act as precursor to Mashiach ben David. He will prepare the world for the coming of the final Redeemer. Different sources attribute to him different functions, some even charging him with tasks traditionally associated with Mashiach ben David, such as the ingathering of the exiles, the rebuilding of the Beit HaMikdash, which is the Holy Temple, and so forth. Yeah, that was very confusing. Yeah, I was saying the same thing. <laughs> so, I'm like, that, well, that's pretty typical for Jewish writings, but <laughs> basically what he's saying is that he, they see two messiahs in the scriptures. One that is Messiah, son of Joseph. He's supposed to be a rep representative of Joseph. Like Joseph's, they see the picture of the Messiah in the life of Joseph like we do. And the other one is Messiah, son of David. And we, there's lots of scripture, and we'll talk about some of them, that refer to David plainly, pretty plainly. I mean, most of us are familiar with Messiah, son of David, even when he, the New Testament, the son of David, mm -hmm. son of David. You know, and right. It talks about David in Ezekiel, and we'll read about that later, that David will rule over God's people in the kingdom. So it's, it's not talking about literal David, it's talking about spiritual, spiritual Messiah, who okay. David is a representation of. And we so, have the advantage of seeing all of this from a distance, right? When he came the first time, they right. they're looking at this in a way that they can't they can't rectify these two very different descriptions of the Messiah. One that's humble, suffering, not much to look at, and another one who's like a king, the a king. conqueror, somebody right. that's going to right. defeat the enemies, mm -hmm. right? And they're so focused on this king to rule over them that it's very easy for them to miss. And again, these are the writings of 
of the Jewish people. This is their, this what is they this, Jewish people that believe in a Messiah. This is typically what they believe. I just always wondered because, like, the thing about I think most Jewish people don't even think about the Messiah anymore. They don't even they're not even waiting for him to come. It you just I mean? depends. There's like, so many Do you talk to Jewish people who say we're still waiting for the Messiah? We can't wait for him to come. We can't like or do so many Jewish people just go to temple and, you know, study the Torah or whatever? Do they even consider the Messiah anymore? Like just I've, like Christianity, there's many different sects of Judaism. So some are are very devout Jews and they are waiting for a Messiah to come and build the temple. But then again, there's there's some that are just more cultural. Cultural. It's a cultural thing. But then the Christians are all waiting for the second coming, the mm -hmm. same as the Jews are waiting for the first coming. Mm -hmm. no, so no, they're no. all still waiting. I'm not, yeah. I always think it's funny though. I asked a Jewish person one time, I, I guess apparently they got offended. And I said, do you ever feel like you just missed, you guys just missed the boat? Like, <laughs> like you guys are still waiting. It's been thousands of that, you know what I mean? Like, you're just, just waiting. Like, you ever feel like maybe he came already and you missed it? Like, and there's stuff in the, in, the, in the scriptures that lead me to believe that many of them will see him when he comes again. I, I don't count them out. Don't count them out as being lost. Because if we're looking at these messianic prophecies, one of the neatest ones to me is about King David when he was he was driven out of his own kingdom and his brothers Judah which represent the Jewish people were the last ones to bring him back in and I think that's representative of our true Messiah David son of David that they will see him but they may be the last ones to bring him in so anyway I found this fascinating because this literally describes the first and second coming of our one true Messiah Yehoshua he did indeed come in order to prepare us before he returns as our conquering king. He began the process of gathering in the exiles, as this article stated. Messiah came to search out and gather the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Remember last time we talked about that. If we are in Yehoshua Messiah, we too are part of God's people whom he has called Israel. Like the article stated regarding Messiah ben Joseph, or Messiah son of Joseph, Yehoshua Messiah is indeed building the spiritual temple of God, which temple we are, a temple that is not made with man's hands, and so forth. So the things that they're seeing that the Messiah Ben Joseph would be doing are the things that Messiah came to do, and that's really what we're going to be focusing on with this study. Most of us are familiar with Yehoshua's role as Messiah, son of David, as we're given his lineage from David, but his role as Messiah, son of Joseph, is not as well known to us, because it has been carefully concealed within the scriptures much in the same way that Joseph was a hidden redeemer. God hid him among the Gentiles, placing him where he needed to be, so that he would be in a position to redeem the people from the death of famine, as we'll learn later in our studies. The same thing happened with Moses and Esther. There were people hidden among the Gentiles for the greater purpose of redeeming God's people from affliction. We'd like to explore Yehoshua Messiah's, Messiah's role as Mashiach ben Yosef, Messiah son of Joseph, our hidden redeemer concealed within the scriptures as compared to Mashiach ben David, Messiah son of David, whom at his coming every eye shall see and every knee will bow. So why Messiah son of Joseph? Why was Joseph one of these figures? Joseph was a suffering servant who was sent by God to redeem God's people, whom he calls Israel and all the people in that land from the death of famine. This could not have been done had Joseph not previously suffered for the sins of others. Now we're not, there'll be in a later, in a later study that we'll, we'll see that he's, his purpose was to redeem them from this famine in the land. But it's relevant to what we're going to be talking about today. This could not have been done had Joseph not previously suffered for the sins of others. Joseph was believed to be dead, but he lived. In spite of being sent into a pit by his brethren, and in spite of his repeated persecution, Joseph continued to be about his heavenly father's business, trusting in him, believing in him, and bearing witness of him in word and in deed. Joseph was his humble servant in all situations, and was favored by God, being given great wisdom from God in the sight of men. Why Messiah, son of David? David was a conquering righteous king of the tribe of Judah. Prior to becoming king, David was a shepherd of his father's sheep. David then became king, shepherding God's people in God's ways. He was a man chosen by God to be king over his people. 
He is documented as being a man of blood who defeated all of his enemies. He is documented as being a man after God's own heart who will do Yahovah's will. David reigned and ruled over all of God's house by fearing Yahovah and loving and upholding the law or Torah of Yahovah. What else is significant about Joseph and David? What we are also seeing represented in these two biblical figures is the regathering of the 12 tribes of Israel in Yehoshua Messiah. King David was of the tribe of Judah. After he died, his son Solomon also ruled over all 12 tribes, or the whole house of Israel. But because of Solomon's sin, Yahovah tore the kingdom of Israel from him. In short, the 12 tribes were split apart into 10 and 2. 10 tribes went out from Jerusalem and became their own kingdom. Then these 10 tribes retained the title of Israel, but they became known as Joseph or Ephraim. Ephraim is Joseph's younger son who obtained the birthright. The two tribes that stayed in Jerusalem were Judah and Benjamin, and they were collectively then called the house of Judah and make up the community we know as the Jewish people. Does that make sense to you what's being said there? As they split, these two are Judah, and the other are being, they're called throughout scripture, Joseph uh, or Ephraim, and they uh, also are referred to as Israel. So you're going to see a lot of different prophecies and things that... About Judah and right. Joseph, or now, Judah the, and Ephraim. The 12 tribes were all after the children, right? Like Joseph and his brothers, right? Is that right? Yeah, Joseph and his brothers make up the 12 tribes. So they each had their own tribe. Mm -hmm. And then at this point, after... After... Uh, yeah, David died. So this is... So those... They're the tribes, but those people are long gone, right? Correct? The ten tribes. Yeah. yeah. Right, they're, like, they're lost. The, those mm -hmm. children, no, they're but I'm talking about the children. children. Like, jo I'm talking oh. about timeline, like Joseph mm -hmm. and his brothers are gone, mm -hmm. right? That's just like the family lineage of, right. of those people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because, uh, in fact, they're in slavery for many years before they even leave Egypt after this point. So the original 12 right. are mm -hmm. only believe. I hesitated putting this in here because I didn't know if it would be, without giving a bunch of um, history, if it would be understood, but uh, it's really neat. <laughs> so <laughs> so Mike, I asked Mike, he's like, no, put it in. So, yeah, it's good. So uh, I'm leaving it in. The 12 tribes were split in two, into the house of Joseph or Ephraim and the house of Judah. Perhaps you're beginning to see the relation to Messiah, son of Joseph, or Ephraim, and Messiah, son of David, or of Judah. Ezekiel chapter 37 speaks of a day when these two tribes will again become one in Yahovah's hand, how David will again be king over them, and his people will again walk in his judgments and statutes. Ezekiel 37, 15. Again, the word of Yahovah came to me, saying, As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it, for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Then join them one to another for yourself into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. And when the children of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will join them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand. And the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. Then say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, and that's the same word for Gentiles, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king over them all. And shall no, they shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. They shall not defile themselves any more with their idols, nor, nor their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and I will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people and I will be their God. David, my servant, shall be king over them, 
and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. So this is one of those scriptures that the Jewish people see, oh, this is the Messiah, son of David, that they're talking about. Because they know it's not literally David, because he's been dead for quite a long time. Then they shall walk in the land, they shall dwell in the land that I've given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt, and they shall dwell there, they, their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The nations, the Gentiles, also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. King David the man had died long before this prophecy was written. He will not be king over God's people. David is a spiritual name for the coming Messiah, who would descend from King David of the house of Judah, just as Yehoshua Messiah did. The two houses of Joseph and Judah are represented in these two biblical figures, and these two biblical figures are both represented by our Messiah, who is the one that will restore the kingdom of Israel as one body under God the Father. Messiah illustrated this very concept of gathering and restoring the house of Israel when he chose to call twelve disciples to follow him and learn from him. The twelve disciples being representative of the restored twelve tribes of Israel, in Yehoshua Messiah. In the life of Joseph, we see a righteous servant who had to suffer in order to redeem the people from death of famine. In the life of David, we see a righteous king who shepherded his father's sheep, was a man of blood who defeated his enemies and the nations, and ruled over the whole house of Israel. I'm sure most of us can see how Yehoshua Messiah fits many of the characteristics portrayed by these two men. However, many expected the coming Messiah to do all of these things at one time, and that could be why many didn't recognize who he was when he came. They expected the suffering servant to immediately become the conquering king, but that was not what he was sent to do at that appointed time. We see that the Messiah's own disciples thought this as well when they asked him this question right after his resurrection. Acts 1, verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? However, we know that this did not happen at that appointed time, and that this will take place when Messiah, son of David, returns to reclaim his kingdom. Likewise, many may be led astray as it is written by the prophesied false Messiah, perhaps because they'll be looking for Messiah ben Yosef instead of looking for the conquering king. We're always quick to say, oh, they didn't recognize him. Oh, why why didn't they see who he was? But we need to keep in mind that we could easily be fooled as well if we're not abiding in the Messiah and abiding abiding in the word because there is some kind of deception that will take place in our era or in our age as well. Although Joseph himself committed no sin, he was falsely accused, arrested, and numbered among the transgressors or those who sinned against their Lord. So this section we're going to talk about how he was numbered with the transgressors. Genesis 40, uh, it said that what we just read was that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended or sinned against their lord, and Pharaoh was angry with his two officers. And then it says that the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and that word charged in Hebrew also means numbered or appointed. So he was numbered or appointed with the transgressors. Just as Joseph was numbered among the transgressors, so was our Messiah. In Isaiah 53, we read Messianic prophecy, Isaiah 53:12. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Like Joseph, who was numbered with the two transgressors, Messiah was also numbered among two transgressors. And I think maybe it was Dell that had caught onto this earlier. John 19, 17, and he bearing his cross went out to a place called the place of skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Yehoshua in the center. Like the two transgressors with Joseph, one of these men was granted life in the Lord's kingdom. The other was sentenced to death. Luke 23, 32, there were also other 
or two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Had Joseph not been sent into prison with these men, he would not have been able to minister to those men. Recall that Joseph served or ministered to these sinners in the prison house. Uh, and that, that's Genesis verse, uh, 40, verse 4. The captain of the guard charged, numbered, or appointed Joseph with them, and he served them or ministered to them. And we know Messiah also came to serve and minister to us as an example of what we must do for others. Mark 10, 44. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. In other words, by serving or ministering to the sinners, Joseph was preaching the gospel of his God to, his, to these men in the prison house. Just as Joseph was sent into a lit literal prison house, Messiah was sent into our spiritual prison house. When he was made flesh, and sent into this world of sin. Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Messiah Yehoshua, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Just as the butler and baker were locked up together for sinning against their Lord, so have we all been locked up together under the law of sin and death for sinning against our Lord, Yahovah. Messiah was a suffering servant who came to us where we were. He was sent to minister us to us in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came into our prison house of sin and death in order to deliver the word of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God, to us that those who humble themselves and believe by hearing and obeying it, even unto death, will live again. This account of Joseph is given to us in the Torah of an innocent man being sent to live under bondage in a prison house with sinners is a shadow picture and a parable, if you will, of what our Messiah came in the flesh to do for us. Isaiah 40, verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. We have all been locked up in prison, under the prison house called the law of sin and death. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 1 John 3 verse 4, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. We have all committed sin, which is lawlessness or Torahlessness, against our Lord. Sin is the transgression and rebellion of God's law that lives in our flesh nature. Sin is what separates us from our God and from living in freedom with him in his kingdom. Like the butler and the baker, whose sin prevented them from serving Pharaoh in his kingdom, God's people could not be restored to again serve him in his kingdom, as we were created to do because of this lawlessness that dwells in our flesh. Isaiah 42, verse 18. Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as he who is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant? Seeing many things, but you do not observe. Opening the ears, but he does not hear. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will exalt the Torah and make it honorable. But this is a people robbed and plundered. All of them are snared in holes, and they are hidden in prison houses. They are for prey, and no one delivers. For plunder, and no one says, restore. 
Who among you will give ear to this? Who will listen and hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for plunder and Israel to the robbers? Was it not Yahovah, he against whom we have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, nor were they obedient to his Torah. It is the law of God, the Torah, that reveals what sin is, just as our laws in the United States reveal what is legal and what is not. Both laws, for example, tell us we shall not murder. If we transgress this law in the United States, will we not be found guilty, imprisoned, and possibly sentenced to death? Likewise, it is the law of God that has found us guilty of sinning against our Lord and has shut us all up, bound, or confined us together under this prison house called sin and death. Galatians 3.22 But the scripture has confined us all under sin, that the promise by faith in Messiah Yehoshua might be given to those who believe. God sent Yehoshua Messiah to deliver hope to those who are in prison. He was born to a woman in the likeness of sinful flesh, born under the same law of sin and death which we are under, to do what we could not do. He came as the living word of God in the flesh to defeat sin and death in the flesh, as an example to us, so that he might redeem those who are under this law of sin and death. Galatians 4 verse 3. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now this law he was born under is not to be confused with the law or the Torah of God, as many erroneously teach. Messiah was not born under the law of God to redeem those who are under the law of God. Paul is talking about the same law he was talking about that we just read in Galatians 3, the law of sin and death that we have all been shut, shut up under together. Our God demonstrated the greatest humility when he came into our prison house of flesh to save us. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, that is, born in the flesh, born under the law, that is, the law of sin and death, to redeem those who are under the law of sin and death, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Sons, to which he says, Proverbs 3, verse 1, My son, do not forget my Torah, but let your heart keep my commands. God did not send his son to redeem us from his law, from his Torah, which if you remember means teaching or instruction. He did not send his son to redeem us from his Torah, which is called holy, righteous, good, light, life, etc. It is not the law of God that we were in bondage to, for God's law is also called liberty, which means freedom, not bondage. God sent his son to redeem us from our sin, which is called lawlessness, in order to call us into the freedom of walking in his law. Psalm 119.44 So shall I keep your Torah continually, forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty, that is freedom, for I seek your precepts. James 1.25 But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, that is freedom, and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. We don't have time to go into more detail about this today, but we do have a couple of videos on this website that, on our website and on YouTube that do. One's called The Schoolmaster and the other is called By Works of Law No Flesh Will Be Justified, But the Doers of the Law Will Be Justified. Both things that Paul says. <laughs> These studies go into great detail on this topic if you'd like to learn more, but we needed to explain this in order to see the messianic fulfillment of this part of Joseph's life. As we continue, keep these things in mind. We'd like to turn now to the book of Luke when we read about how the Messiah stood up before the congregation on the Sabbath day to proclaim the word of God in the ears of the people. He chose to read a specific section from the book of the prophet Isaiah because it is here that he illustrates his purpose to fulfill this very specific role as Messiah, son of Joseph, at that appointed time. Luke 4, 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 
He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to and they be, he began to say to them, "Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing." Mm-hmm. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth, and they said, "Is this not Joseph's son?" Mm-hmm. Let's go now to this chapter he's reading from in Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. We're going to take a very in-depth look at this passage as he reveals his role as Messiah, son of Joseph. Isaiah 61. So this is what he was quoting, reading from. Verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now note that this is where the Messiah closed the book, but Isaiah goes on to say, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Why did Messiah close the book before reading about the day of vengeance? Why didn't he finish the reading? We'll come back to this question later. Remember in part one of the study that we stress the importance of looking deeper than the translations? We're going to look deeper at the Hebrew words that are used here in order to gain a better understanding of what he is being said. So Isaiah 61, 1, we're going to dissect this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, and that is the Spirit of Adonai Yahovah in Hebrew, is upon me, because Yahovah has anointed me. The word because, it's seemingly simple, is Yahan, and it means for the purpose of. The word anointed here is the Hebrew word Mashach, and the root word for Mashiach, or Messiah, which means anointed one. First, it's important to note with this reading, Yehoshua is indicating that he is the anointed of Yahovah. He then goes on to tell us for what purpose Yahovah sent him. The spirit of Adonai Yahovah is upon me for this purpose Yahovah has anointed me. Messiah wants us to understand the purpose for which he came. To preach good tidings. Preach good tidings is one Hebrew word. It's the Hebrew word basar, and means to proclaim good news or good things. This is the Hebrew word for gospel. Yahweh sent the Messiah for the purpose of preaching the gospel, which is the word of the kingdom of God. And to whom did he come to deliver this word? To the poor. Poor is the Hebrew word anav, and means meek, humble, needy, weak, lowly or afflicted so that's everyone <laughs> <laughs> not just people without money there are a couple things to look to look at with this this word is used to describe humility and meekness in the scriptures it is the same hebrew word used to describe moses as being the most humble anav man on the face of the earth messiah is not telling us that he came to preach the gospel to people without money as pj just said but to the humble or meek of heart Remember how Messiah says, unless we humble ourselves as a little child, we will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven? A a humble child will hear their parents' instructions and do what they say, but a prideful and arrogant son who thinks he knows better rebels against their father's words. Can one truly hear and receive the gospel of truth from their heavenly father if they are not first willing and able to humble themselves in his sight? Can a prideful heart truly receive God's words? This word also means to be afflicted in Hebrew. A word's root word in Hebrew is always associated with its meaning. The root word for the word poor, anav, is the Hebrew word ana, and is the same Hebrew word used to describe the affliction of the children of Israel, who, much like the butler and the baker in the chapter we read, were afflicted by their slavery and bondage in the prison house in Egypt. Israel was afflicted, Anna, by Pharaoh in a strange land and forced to serve and work for him. And perhaps these two men in the prison house with Joseph are foreshadowing this very thing. Messiah came to both proclaim the gospel to those whose hearts are humbled and, humbled and willing to receive it, and to those who are afflicted in their slavery to sin and bondage to men. 
Just as Yahweh called Israel his firstborn son out of their sin and bondage to Pharaoh in Egypt, so that they might receive his Torah, his instruction in the wilderness, and serve him by the blood of a Passover lamb, so did Yahovah send his son, Yehoshua Messiah, the true Passover lamb, into the earth to call us, spiritual Israel, out of our sin and bondage to serving men, so that we may receive his Torah, his instruction, and serve him. So we've talked about how Joseph had to suffer in order to redeem God's people from the famine, which would have led to their death, which we'll learn about later in a later chapter. God used Joseph to literally save the people from famine by giving literal seed to the people and telling them to sow in the land. Spiritually speaking, it was for the purpose, this purpose, that Yehoshua Messiah ben Joseph, Jesus Christ, son of Joseph, came to us. Like Joseph, Yehoshua Mashiach ben Yosef came to redeem you and I from the true famine by giving us seed that we may live and to sow it in the land. Except ours is not a literal famine for food or water, it is a famine for hearing the words of Yahovah. Amos 8.11 Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor thirst for water, but of hearing the words of Yahovah. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. Like Joseph, Messiah, son of Joseph, was sent to us to give us seed. Messiah tells a parable about a sower who went out to sow his seed in the hearts of men. And what happens when the seed is received into hearts that are not able to receive it, compared to a heart that receives it and produces its fruit in the land. Like Joseph, Yehoshua Messiah went out from his father's house to sow his seed in the earth. Luke 8, verse 5. A sower went out to sow his seed. Yehoshua Messiah is the sower. What is he sowing? What is the seed? Verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. We won't go into depth with this parable, because we'll be here all night if I do. <laughs> but it's important to understand that receiving seed from the Messiah is to receive the word of life from the Father who sent him by hearing, understanding, and doing what it says. Just how important is it, according to our Messiah, that one receives the seed of God's word in their inner man? One example of someone that does not keep the seed of God's word in his heart is described as receiving seed by the wayside. Matthew 13, verse 18. Therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. Another version in Luke 8, 12. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. This one hears the gospel of the kingdom but does not understand it. Satan has stolen the word of life from him. And if we do not receive the word of life in our hearts and minds with understanding, then we cannot believe and be saved. How can we truly believe in the Messiah of Yahovah, who rose from the dead if we are not willing or able to hear or receive the word of Yahovah who sent him? The answer is, we can't. This is made evident in another one of Messiah's parables of the rich man and Lazarus. Luke 16, 27. This is the end of that parable. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him, meaning Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them that they also come, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. That's pretty cool. If we are not willing to hear and obey the Torah and the prophets and repent, neither will we be able to hear the Messiah's words, the one who rose from the dead, because the Torah and the prophets is the same word of repentance and the same gospel that the Messiah came 
to deliver to us. Now let's look at how Messiah describes a good heart that receives the seed of God's word. Matthew 13, 23. But he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. When the word of God is received into a good heart, this is described as one who hears, understands, and does what it says, produces its fruit. To produce good fruit is to produce the fruit of the good seed of God's word that is in us, fruit being a biblical metaphor for our works. You can see Matthew 7, 16 through 17, and Jeremiah 17, 10 for some examples of that. If we have truly received the seed, which is God's word, in the good ground of our heart, then we will by nature do or produce the fruit of God's word in our lives for all men to see to the glory of God. Messiah ben Yosef, Messiah son of Joseph, is the sower who was sent into the earth to save us from the famine of hearing the words of Yahweh, which Amos prophesied of. This life-giving word of God is the gospel or good news of the kingdom of God. Luke 4, 43, but he, Messiah, said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also. It was for this purpose that I was sent. Matthew 4, 23. Then Yehoshua went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Again, we see the purpose for which Yahweh sent his anointed one into the earth, to preach the good news of the kingdom of heaven, or what we refer to as the gospel. Acts 8, verse 4. Then indeed the ones who being scattered passed through preaching the gospel, the word, and going down to a city of Samaria, Philip proclaimed Messiah to them. In church, most of us have only been taught one piece of the gospel, that Jesus died for our sins and rose again, that we might live. And while this is most certainly an important part of the gospel, it is not the only part of the gospel. Remember that gospel is the Hebrew word basar, the gospel is not a New Testament teaching, but what the prophets of old were preaching. And make no mistake, they were preaching Messiah. How many of us have been taught that the gospel, however, is not just something we must hear, but it is something we must obey? 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 6. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest, give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Yehoshua Messiah these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Make note of this day of vengeance here that will come upon those who do not obey the gospel. We'll come back to this again later. Romans 1 verse 5, Through him, Messiah, we have received God's grace and our appointment to be apostles. This was to bring all Gentiles to faithful obedience for his name's sake. Romans 6, 17, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Romans 15, 15, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you, because of the grace given to me by God, that I might be a minister of Yehoshua Messiah to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sac sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Yehoshua Messiah and the things which pertain to God, for I do not dare to speak any of those things which Messiah has not accomplished through me, in word and in deed, to make the Gentiles obedient. Also, I, I, this kind of popped out at me right now, too, is understanding that it is Messiah working through us, his spirit working through us that causes us to come into obedience to his word. And I, I know you kind of touched on it briefly a couple slides back about the, um, the gospel and the, 
the message that we get from the church about um, him dying for our sins and that being a, a big part of um, the message, but really that wasn't the gospel he was preaching. On occasion he talked about uh, being destroyed and coming back again, but for the most part the scriptures that you were pointing out about him going from town to town preaching the gospel, he wasn't telling them that he was going to die for their sins. No. You know? He was he was keeping that secret. Right. But he was um, saying, abide in me, abide in my word. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. And if you love me, keep my commandments. So what he was preaching was the word of God. The problem that I struggle with is... I mean, does anybody obey to to the extent that he wants? It's not about doing it right. And we're going to get actually into that a little bit. It's about having a heart's desire to do his will. When we put up those walls and say, I don't have to do that, or I don't, I don't want to do that, or okay, I'll do it, and you don't do it. Is that doing what God wants you to do? Are you forsaking your own desires for his and, and he makes these things known to us by his spirit but you have to abide in his word you have to seek him there's no greater form of worship than to learn everything you can about the God you serve so I want to know how do you want me to serve you what can I do for you look at all the stuff you've done for me what can I now do for you a rebellious heart will say I don't have to do that and there's a difference in your perspective on how you look at God's word. Don't look at it like, I can't do this because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And if that means walking in his word, well, yeah, I think that's going to work. But that doesn't mean you're going to do it right. Or think about, like, from a father-son perspective, mm -hmm. right? And your son knows he's got to go out in the backyard and he's got to do some work. And it looks really tough. And so he goes, I'm never going to do this right. It's not going to get done the way my dad wants me to do it, so I'm not going to do anything. When you come home from work and you see that, rather than seeing your son attempting to do what he was supposed to do, which action are you more pleased with? Mm -hmm. Messiah tells a parable. He says a father had two sons. He told him to go out and work in his field. The first one, he said, go out and work in my field, and forgive me if I get them flip-flopped, but go out and work in my field, and he says... Uh, no. And the second one, he says, go out, my work, go out and work in my field. He says, okay, I go. But he doesn't go. But the first one that said no had a change of heart. And he felt bad. He felt guilty. And, 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 and he went. And he did what he was supposed to do. That's a picture of repentance. And the Messiah says, now which one did the will of the Father? Even though the one said, I'm not going to do it. Later, he repented and he went. And he did it. So it's, I really just want people to understand it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of your desire to please God and to do what is right in his eyes and your willingness to forsake the things that are right in your own eyes. If it's something that he reveals to you that is not pleasing to him, we need to have the heart that says, I'll give it up for you. And that's what Messiah talks about. If you're not willing to forsake all, you're not worthy to be my disciple. The goal is to be his disciple, walk in his path and walk in his footsteps and learn from him. And, that, and that's what a loving father does. And what's a shepherd of a sheep? He guides his sheep. He doesn't beat his sheep. He feeds them gently and, and teaches them in the way they should go. And they're going to mess up. They're going to stray off. And he's got the hook on his, on his little cane and he pulls them back on the path. That's, what, that's the kind of walk we need to keep in mind when we're thinking about walking in the way of God and the Torah of God. It's the, the word Torah just means instruction. It's God's ruling dominion. And, and if we want to live in his kingdom, we're going to have to live under his rules. And we are now supposed to proclaim the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. So how do we do that? We go to his word and say, how does God want us to serve him? Let's do that now. Let's do that here so that people can see that and see who our God is. And be drawn to him. Let us not act like them and do what they do because that's, we're going to talk about later, that's 
the, the salt of the earth. You, you become flavorless. Your light has gone out. Well, now you're not drawing people to God. You're just melting and blending in with them. In fact, when the, he told them they were going to go into the land, right, and he gave them this Torah, that they would look at his people and say, who is this nation that serves such a wonderful mm -hmm. God? And they will say, what wisdom do they have? Uh, as all the wisdom of this Torah, specifically, it is the Torah of God that gives us wisdom, not of itself, but through the Spirit of God and through understanding. And that is something we have to cry out for. We have to seek. He says, seek, knock, ask. He's not talking about physical things. He's talking about the Spirit. And, and the, I think it's Luke where he says, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So if we want to understand, we have to ask and we have to seek diligently. So we were talking about obeying the gospel, and this is another scripture from Romans 10, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings, basar, of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah, Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Paul quotes Isaiah 53, 1 here, when he says, who has believed our report? This is the, that chapter that tells us how the Messiah will come to suffer and die for our sins. Paul then equates disobedience to the gospel to disbelief in the gospel. And he tells us that faith or belief comes by hearing the word of God. Acts 6, verse 7. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Remember that Yehoshua was sent for the purpose of preaching the gospel or good news of the kingdom of God, and careful study of the majority of his teachings and parables are all about hearing his word and obeying it. John 14, 23, Yehoshua answered and said to them, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. And he, will, and he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. So to go back to the, the reason why we seek to obey God's word, our answer should never be because I want to be saved. You seek to obey his word because you are saved. It's the fruit of your salvation. Your answer should be, I obey God because I love him. And that's what he's saying. Simply, if you love me, you'll do what I ask you to do. You'll do. Well, but at the same time, when my son disobeys me, it's not because he doesn't love me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and so. <clears throat> or when you correct him, mm -hmm. it's not because you don't love him. Right, you correct him because you love him. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you don't make that correction when he disobeys, how does that relationship prosper? I would find that it would be difficult if there was a, if there was no correction from disobedience to be able to maintain a functioning relationship. Mm -hmm. You would continue to do things that hurt you. you would, you're saying, okay, son, Please do this because this shows me that that you love me, right? And when he continues to go against that, how do you how do you build a relationship with him? Well, and, and scripturally, that's what God says. He loves those he disciplines those whom he loves. And if we don't accept that discipline, we are no longer sons. This is I'm quoting from the Hebrews, from the book of Hebrews. It was that who God addresses as his children. And, and what he asks of them, this is what we strive to be. And John 1 talks about Messiah, and as many as received him, who is this, he is the seed, this word of God sent into the earth, they are given the right to become sons of God, who are born through the seed of God's word. So it's the spiritual seed we're talking about now. And his word is the word that we're supposed to be reborn from. 
Messiah came for the purpose of delivering the word of his father to us. The gospel is good news, good words, or good doctrine. Who is documented as giving his children good doctrine to which they should obey? Proverbs 4, verse 1. Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding, for I give you good doctrine. Do not forsake my Torah. Messiah said, John 5, 24, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes, believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Messiah tells us that eternal life depends on whether or not we will hear the words of Yahovah and believe in him. So it is vital to understand what hearing and believing means to God. And I had originally planned on going into the, the Hebrew for both of these words, but I don't have the time to do it. James 2.19 says, You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. If belief is just to believe in something, or to believe something exists, then the demons themselves would have eternal life in the kingdom. But we know that this is not the case. So then we must ask ourselves, what makes my belief different from the belief of demons? Turning back to Isaiah 61, Messiah goes on to tell us what else he was sent to do. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, or broken of heart in the Hebrew. The Hebrew word for heal here is kabosh, and means to bind up, bandage, to heal, or to wrap firmly. Messiah was sent to bind up the broken of heart. What does it mean to be broken of heart? To be broken hearted means more than just being sad. We were broken in our hearts, our inner man, because of sin. This is the same Hebrew word used when Moses broke, kabosh, God's word on the tablets of stone on the foot of the mountain, after seeing Israel's sin of the golden calf. This breaking of the words of God was symbolic for God's people breaking God's heart. When they broke their covenant with him, they sinned when they sinned against him. Messiah came to bind up our hearts, which, like those words on tablets of stone, had been broken because of our sin. Hosea 6, 1 through 2. Come and let us return to Yahovah, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind Kabash us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. We'll come back again to the scripture later in our Joseph study, but for now I'd like to look at the word return in this passage, because we must first return before our hearts can be bound or healed up, or bound up or healed. Return is the Hebrew word shuv and means repent. Come and let us repent to Yahovah. We've already read some verses stressing the importance of repentance. In Hebrew, repentance means to turn from the path that you are on and return to the path that you strayed from. In other words, turn from the path which leads to death, the path of sin, and return to the narrow path that leads back to your father's house and to life. Jeremiah 31, 21, set up signposts, make landmarks, set your heart toward the highway, the way in which you went. Turn back, shuv, O virgin of Israel, turn back, shuv, to these your cities. Turn away from sin and turn back to the path that leads to the kingdom of your heavenly Father. Recall in our reading today, at the end of this chapter, at the end of chapter uh, Genesis 40, that Pharaoh restored the butler to his place. This is the same Hebrew word for repentance. Shuv, the butler had returned to his place in his master's house. A picture of repentance. We'll talk more about this next time when we dissect this chapter. We just read a passage from Jeremiah 31 which speaks of repentance and returning to the path he went out from. This chapter in Jeremiah is actually the reference for the parable of the prodigal son that Yehoshua Messiah tells. For those of you who are not familiar with this parable, let's look to Luke chapter 15 to read the first part of the parable to see how Messiah is illustrating this very same picture of repentance to us. Luke 15, starting in verse 11. Then he said, A certain man had two sons. 
And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the paws that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. So the prodigal son went out from his father's house and journeyed to a far country. This represents our journey as we've all gone out from the father and onto a path of sin which leads to death. Notice the father said that his son was lost and he was dead. But after his return, he was found and alive. We cannot return to the right path that leads to life unless we realize and are able to confess that we are lost on the wrong one. The prodigal, the prodigal son joined himself with the people of a foreign land. This has been the cycle of God's people from the beginning. Instead of glorifying God by being the salt of the earth and the light of the world for the purpose of pointing the foreigner or the stranger home to the Father and to his Torah, God's people have become flavorless and their lights have gone out. Instead of teaching people how to walk in God's Torah or instruction, we've joined ourselves with the world adopting their ways and becoming like them. Our example is given when the prodigal son realized the error of his ways and said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread, enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. I will say to him, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, just out of curiosity, does he say that because his... Because the servants are eating and he is not? Does the prodigal son say that the servants are eating? So he sees, he says, how many of my father's servants have bread to spare and I'm hungry? Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to go to my father and say, I don't deserve to be your son anymore. I want to be your, I'll, I'll be your servant because the servants are eating. Well, what I'm trying to get at here. He's starving and dying because he doesn't have the word of God, the word of the Father, the bread of life. And when he realizes where he is, where he's destitute and dying, it causes him to have a change of heart. And then he realizes how good it was in his father's house. And this is the picture that we should be bringing to our own minds about you know, a lot of us don't come to the Father until we're in a real bad place. Yeah. You know, and I think that that's a similar, you know, situation here. I know, speaking from experience, Mike and I had to go through some pretty bad stuff. But we, we never turned our backs on God. You know, we may not have known what we were doing, but we always believed in God, and we always believed in Jesus, and and. Uh, it, but it wasn't until we started seeking him and really s trying to learn of him through his word and trying to please him, help me be pleasing to you, 
stop putting God in my own box and let me be made in his image that that we were changed that our hearts were truly changed and, and we could feel I'm speaking for myself I could feel him changing me who I was I'm not, I'm not as selfish as I was I'm I'm it's it's literally like the spirit of God like Messiah is in you trying to get to other people changing you from the inside out not from the outside in and it is through the washing of his word the cleansing of his word that does that it's not of ourselves but what we have to do is be diligent and abide in his word and and call on him for our help is that does that answer your question or did i just go off on a totally no, different I, tangent? I, I, <laughs> I just, I guess, I, I, I understand what the parable is trying to teach, mm-hmm. right? But at the same time, I look at that, that, that son and think to myself, it also is very interesting that he saw that the servants were eating and he was not, and so now he wanted to be a servant, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And yeah. That, because he was dying without. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is he, it? He was yeah. dying without. He was he was like, look at the servants eating. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to be a servant. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's uh, but the food is compared to the spirit, right? Yeah, the that's food. That's what you're trying to say. To his word, yes, to the word of God. Mm-hmm. So let me see if any of this uh, helps. Helps. So he that. was he was willing to be in. As low as the servants, yes. because they were. He right. was so low that they, the servants, were above him. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you're right. He did notice that the servants had plenty to mm-hmm. eat. You know. So, uh, like I had just mentioned, the son was dying from famine in a foreign land, but he remembered the bread of his father's house, and this is the famine for hearing the words of Yahovah. The son was humbled, and he humbled himself. And had a change of heart and repented. So that picture of repentance is this, I'm, out, I'm going this way, but I need to go this way. And so that's what he did. He humbled himself and returned to his father's house, confessed his sins, asked him for his forgiveness, and was now willing to humbly work for his father and be his servant. He didn't have a rebellious mind anymore. He didn't say, my father will forgive me so I don't have to do anything. This is not what a servant's heart looks like. A servant is one who obeys the will or word of his master. Therefore, a servant is one who obeys the will and word of Yahovah, not man. For example, in Luke 6, 46, Messiah says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? The prodigal son repented, and he returned not by some different path, but by the same old path that he had gone out from. What does this path back to the father's house represent? It is called a path for a reason. It is something we must walk in. It is the path of obedience. It represents our willingness to hear and walk toward our Father by walking in the laws of the Father's house. So he's walking toward that, knowing that I'm going to go and serve him. Isaiah 30, verse 8. Now go, write it before them on a tablet and note it on a scroll, that it may be for a time to come forever and ever that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the Torah of Yahovah, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things, speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits, get out of the way, turn aside from the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Who did Yahovah call a rebellious, lying child? It is one who refuses to hear and walk in his law, his Torah. Those who turn aside from the path, a path that leads to the Holy One of Israel. Rebellious people and lying children want to shut the mouths of the prophets who preach the Torah of Yahovah, because the Torah reveals sin. They'd rather listen to the lies which their flesh ears find more pleasing in order to continue to walk in the sinful desires of their own heart. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and in his kingdom, 
Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Remember the good or sound doctrine of the Father is his Torah and the same word that rebellious children refuse to hear. Remember Proverbs 4 verse 1. Hear, my children, the instruction of a father. Give attention to no understanding, for I give you good doctrine. Do not forsake my Torah. When I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me and said to me, Let your heart retain my words. Keep my commands and live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. These are some of the words of the Messiah when he told the parable of the sower. Get understanding, let your heart retain my words. Keep my commands and live. Turning away from the words of Yahovah's mouth has been Satan's desire for God's people from the beginning in the garden. Look to these patterns. Satan's motive has been, and always will be, to convince God's people with a smooth tongue that God didn't really mean what he said, that we don't really have to obey his words. Where he said, did God really say that? Did God say, don't eat that? No, you can eat that. He'll find a way to convince you that it's okay to do what God has said not to do and vice versa. Remember what we just read in Jeremiah. Lying, rebellious children who won't hear the Torah will say to those who preach Torah, get out of the way, turn aside from the path. Do not preach right things, preach to us smooth things. We'd rather hear fables, we'd rather hear lies. But according to Proverbs 4, children of God are those who hear his Torah and keep their father's words in their hearts and live. Jeremiah 6, 16, thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. And then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Messiah quotes the scripture when he says, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Ask for the old paths, the good way, and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Come to me, the word of God made flesh. Learn from me, and you will find rest for your souls. We're going to tie that into John. Uh, Which part in John? First John. Can I read that real quick? Sure. So it kind of goes back to what you were saying about the old path. Oh, the old commandment you heard from the beginning? And and the rest for your soul. It says, but whomever keeps his word, truly in this one, truly in this one, the love of God has been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one saying to rest in him ought to, ought so to walk himself as that one walked. Brothers, I do not write a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. I actually do have that in here. <clears throat> oh, well, I blew it. No, it's okay. That's great. I'm glad that you saw it. I don't know how you read anything that small. I know, and it's dark, too. Over there. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> so Messiah himself came preaching in Matthew four seventeen. Repent, that is to say, return, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Messiah was sent to bind up or heal the hearts of those who wish to repent to return to him through the old paths that lead back to the Father's house. It is by humbling ourselves like the prodigal son that we are given a new heart by his spirit, a heart that is now willing to forsake all and work for and serve our Heavenly Father by doing and proclaiming his will, his word, on earth as it is in heaven. Ezekiel thirty six twenty four is prophecy. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land, just like the prodigal son. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. 
I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. The Hebrew word for new here is kadash and means a fresh new thing. However, it comes from the Hebrew word kadash, which means to be new, renew, repair, or rebuild. God does not literally give us a new heart, but Yehoshua was sent to renew or repair our broken, sinful hearts in order to rebuild his kingdom on earth. A new or renewed heart is given to a child of God. A new a renewed heart that is now prepared and able to humbly hear, receive, and do the Father's instruction for his children. A renewed heart that we may now receive because God has made a new or renewed covenant with us in Messiah's blood for remission of our sins. It is by the blood of the one who is called our Passover lamb because he died at the appointed time of Passover, who made it possible for us to come home to the Father. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 b for indeed christ our passover was sacrificed for us matthew 26 1 now it came to pass when yehoshua had finished all these things that he said to his disciples you know that after two days is the passover and the son of man will be delivered up to be crucified skipping forward to verse 27 then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink from it all of you for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Jeremiah thirty one thirty one is the context of that new covenant. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new or renewed Kadash covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my Torah, my instruction, in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. The Torah written in the hearts and minds of God's people <clears throat> is, what is what it means for the seed of his word to be received in a good heart. And it simply means this. Just as our master was the word of God made flesh, so shall his servants be. We too are called to be walking words of God for all men to read. It is by doing the works written in God's word that we proclaim his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, being the salt of the earth and the light of the world glorifying God in word and in deed, and pointing all men back to him and to his word. Are you going to reference uh, that Jeremiah scripture back to Hebrews? Uh, quotes this new covenant in Hebrews 8 and 10. Right, and uh-huh. talking about how the new high priest is what brings in that new covenant, with the house of Israel bringing these people back together and writing those laws which is Yehoshua Messiah. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2. You are our epistle, you are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly you are an epistle, a letter of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. Paul is referencing what we just read. The Torah will be written in the hearts and minds of God's people. It is this renewed covenant in Jeremiah of the Torah being written in the hearts and minds of God's people. And Paul is speaking to Gentiles who are turning to God, to the Romans and to the Corinthians. Romans 2.12, when he says, For as many as have sinned without the Torah will also perish without the Torah. And as many as have sinned in the Torah will be judged by the Torah. For not the hearers of the Torah are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the Torah will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the Torah by nature do the things in the Torah, these, although not having the Torah, are a Torah to themselves. They are a walking word of God. That's a mouthful. Yeah, it is. (laughs) A lot of his writings are like that. 
You show the work of the Torah written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts, ex accusing or else excusing them. It is a mouthful, and like she said, Paul writes this way all over his letters, yet our church makes entire doctrines out of misunderstood letters. The problem is, is they make... They, they seek to understand Paul's writings before they seek to understand the scriptures because if you don't have understanding of the scriptures, you're not going to understand the things Paul says. All right, I'm running behind here. To wrap up the segment about binding up the broken heart, we see in both Ezekiel and Jeremiah that those to whom God says, I will be your God and you shall be my people, are those who walk in the spirit because they have received his Torah in their inner man and walk in his way by his spirit. This is not some new or different Torah. It is not some fictitious moral law, but true spiritual understanding of the unchanging word of God and the old path we are to ask for, which we have had from the beginning. And this is the scripture Mike just read, so he saved me some time there. But uh, he's saying this is not a new commandment. Walk as he walked. This is the old command which you've had from the beginning. Let's go back now to Isaiah 61 to finish up what else the Messiah was sent to do at this appointed time. Uh, so he was also sent to proclaim liberty to the captives. The Hebrew word for proclaim is kara and means to recite, call, or cry out, read aloud, or invite. We have been called out of slavery to sin and invited into the freedom of serving Yahovah by keeping his righteous words, his good doctrine. In fact, the word translated as church in the New Testament is the Greek word ecclesia and would be better translated as a calling out or the called out. Biblically speaking, the church is not a building we go to, but a body of people, God's people who have been called out of slavery to sin and bondage to men, just like they were called out of Egypt, and have returned to the liberty or freedom which is found in serving the living God and upholding and establishing his laws in the earth. This doctrine is the freedom that Yehoshua Messiah was sent to deliver and restore to the captives. Romans 6, 16, do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart, that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And remember what we read in James 1, 25 and Psalms 119, 44 through 45, that the Torah of Yahovah is liberty and freedom. Messiah came to proclaim or call out this freedom to the captives. This is the Hebrew word Shabbat, which means those who have been taken captive or led away. You must repent or return to God because sin has led us away from God. Messiah, must, Messiah came to proclaim freedom to those who have been led away. We see this pattern of God's people being led into captivity to men in Egypt, in Assyria, in Babylon, etc. over and over again in the Bible. And it's because his people refused to walk in his ways. They refused to keep his words and commands, so he gave them over and allowed them to be taken captive by that which they desired. Just like the prodigal son, he wanted that. He wanted to go out and get that, and he allowed him to be taken captive by that which he desired. Like our fathers before us, this is a shadow picture for we who have also been taken into spiritual captivity of sin and death. Messiah came to call out freedom to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. The Hebrew word for opening of the prison is peka koach. The word peka means more than simply opening a door, but is associated with opening the eyes wide and being clear sighted. We're given many accounts of how Messiah restored the sight to the blind, which is a parable or physical representation of what he came to do spiritually, which is to open our spiritual eyes that have been shut because of sin. The Holy Spirit is given for the purpose of opening our understanding to God's word and receiving the truth because of Yehoshua Messiah's sacrifice for us. Psalm 119, 18, Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your Torah. Luke 24, 44, then Messiah said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the Torah of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. He came to proclaim freedom to the captives and open the eyes of those who are bound in the spiritual prison for sinning against our Lord. 
The Hebrew word bound is asar and means to tie, bind, imprison, confine, or to yoke. It is no coincidence that this is the same word used to describe the place where Joseph was sent. He was confined or bound in the prison house right along with the transgressors. So in uh, last chapter, chapter 39, verse 20, uh, they, they put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisons, prisoners were confined, bound. That's that same word, asar. And he was there in prison. And today's ver chapter in verse uh, 2, he was in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined, but, uh, uh, bound, or asar in Hebrew. Again, we see the picture of how Yehoshua Messiah ben Yosef was bound in the same spiritual prison house of the law of sin and death that we have been bound by. It is, is, it, it is a yoke or a burden to be bound by sin and the doctrine and tradition of men, but as we've read, it is called freedom, liberty, and rest to hear and obey God's words. Man has perverted God's words, however, and tied heavy burdens on people that they are unable to bear. Jeremiah twenty three thirty six. And the burden of Yahweh shall you mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. For you have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of, God, Lord of hosts, our God. Matthew 15, 6. You have made the commandment of God no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart, where his word is supposed to be, is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Matthew 23, 4. For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works, are, all their works they do to be seen by men. Scripture teaches us that it is the doctrine and tradition of men, the perversion of God's words by men, and our desire to seek our help from men, which is the true burden, which has brought us into captivity. Messiah came to free us from this same yoke and affliction of men, in the same way that Yahweh redeemed Israel from the bondage and affliction of Egyptian slavery. Psalm 107, verse 10. Those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in afflictions and irons, because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought their, down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, and he broke their chains in pieces. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, for he has broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. Fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities were afflicted. Anah, their soul abhorred all manner of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Over and over again, God's people rebelled against him, hating him and disregarding his Torah. Over and over again, they cried out in their distress and affliction, which was the result of rejecting his Torah. Yet by his grace and mercy alone, he delivered them. We are no different in this day and age. One last time he has sent his living word to heal and deliver us, but after this there remains no more sacrifice for our sins. We are being given one last chance to believe, to hear, keep, and do the Torah of Yahovah. Only this time he sent his son, the prophesied Messiah, to deliver healing and freedom to us. John 1, 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Deuteronomy 18, 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you, Moses, from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth. This is about the Messiah, by the way. And he shall speak to them all that I command him, and it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. Over and over again, Yahweh sent his prophets to his people to deliver his words to them, and over and over again, they rejected his Torah. Finally, he sent his word in the flesh. Yahweh has given his people grace upon grace. Grace is not new. The question is, will we repeat the same mistakes as our fathers before us? John 1, 16, we have all received from his fullness, yes, grace upon grace. For the Torah was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Yehoshua Messiah. Matthew 21, 33, hear another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower 
and he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they, ha they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? They said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render him the fruits in their season. Yehoshua Messiah is the prophet like Moses and the son in the parable of the landowner. Oh, and the son in the parable. The landowner is God the Father, and he sent his son to his people. Again, we see that the Father is looking for fruit. He's looking for people who will hear his word and produce it in the land. Like God's prophets before him, Yehoshua came preaching the Torah of Yahweh, and they killed them. But he is the prophesied one of Deuteronomy 18 that we all must hear. And if we do not hear him, then the day will come when Yahweh will require it of us. Hebrews 10:26. For if we willfully sin, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy, who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember that this day of vengeance of Yahweh is the part in Isaiah where the Messiah closed the book. He didn't read about the day of vengeance at that appointed time because he did not come at that appointed time to proclaim the day of vengeance. But, back to Isaiah 61, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahovah. The word acceptable in the Hebrew is ratzon, which means pleasure, delight, goodwill, favor, and acceptance. Messiah came to proclaim the time of acceptance or of the favor or goodwill of Yahovah toward us, a time of God's grace. One last time to hear and receive his words. This is the place that the Messiah chose to stop reading in Luke, but Isaiah goes on to say, and the day of vengeance of our God. Previously, we discussed what Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians 1 about the day of vengeance, which will come upon those who do not obey the gospel. Messiah will also be sent to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God, which is the Hebrew word nakam. This word means vengeance, revenge, or to avenge. This section in Isaiah speaks of a future day of Yahovah's wrath, known as the day of the Lord, or the day of Yahovah, and this is the day he comes to avenge his people. Isaiah 34, 8. For it is the day of Yahovah's vengeance, Nakam, the year of recompense, which means retribution. Retribution is reward or punishment for the cause of Zion. Isaiah 62.10, go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, take out the stones, lift up a banner for the peoples. Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world, say to the daughter of Zion, surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him, and they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. Revelation 22, 11, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega in the Greek, but in Hebrew, more accurately, would be the Aleph and the Tab, the first and the last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. One thing that these two letters represent is the entirety of God's word from the beginning and to the end. I am the word of God, the first letter representing the Father, the last representing the Son. The beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commands that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. 
Revelation 6.10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the land? Isaiah 63.1, Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah, this one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save, why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance, Nakam, is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. The day of vengeance is also the year of the redeemed of Yahovah. Revelation 19.11, we see this fulfilled. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This day marks the end of that grace period, or the acceptable year of Yahovah. And recall that King David was a man of blood who defeated his enemies. Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah son of Joseph, was sent to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahovah. But Messiah, son of David, will proclaim the day of vengeance of our, God, of our God. A day in which he will avenge his redeemed and give to everyone according to their works. And this is why Messiah didn't read that part in Isaiah. This is why he closed the book at that time, because it was not yet time for him to fulfill those things. At that time, Messiah said the things that he read were being fulfilled in the ears of those who were listening. And the things he read are indeed the things that he came the first time to do. He preached the gospel, healed the brokenhearted, restored sight to the blind, literally and spiritually, etc. He came at that appointed time to proclaim the year of Yahovah's acceptance, the acceptable year of Yahovah, an appointed time of God's grace. What he did not come to fulfill at that time was to proclaim the day of Yahovah, the day of vengeance of our God. These are things that he will do in the future when he returns as our conquering king who will come again to avenge his people. Um, this is just talking about how, uh, by reading that passage, he's telling you what he came to do, and John the Baptist asks his disciples to, to go find out if this is really the Messiah. And instead of answering plainly, Messiah just tells him to tell John that he's fulfilling scripture, basically. And it says, ask him, are you the coming one or do we look for another? And Messiah says, go and tell John the things which you hear and see, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed who he is, is he who is not offended because of me. Recall that at the end of Messiah's reading, we are told that the crowd asked a question, is this not Joseph's son? We must not disregard the seemingly simple question because little details like this are oftentimes very important. Oftentimes, obviously, Yahushua's father's name, according to the flesh, was Joseph, but that is not merely coincidental. There is this literal meaning that we should take at face value. However, there is also an amazing prophetic and spiritual meaning behind this question. Messiah ben Yosef came once to us as a suffering servant, and he will come again as Messiah ben David, the conquering king, to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort and rule over God's people, and restore and establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> the section on Isaiah he chose not to read, or they chose to read, was proclaiming himself as Messiah ben Yosef, the Messiah son of Joseph. After Messiah read all the things that he was sent to do as Messiah ben Yosef, then the people immediately asked, Is this not ben Yosef? After hearing and learning more about what Yehoshua came to do at this appointed time, I ask you, is this not Moshiach ben Yosef? The part that Messiah chose not to read is just as important as the part he did read. The part which proclaims his function as Messiah ben David, a role which he will fulfill later. 
Remember in part one of our study that we read from Matthew 5, 17, where Messiah said, I did not come to do away with the Torah or the prophets, but to fulfill them. Today's study is an excellent example of what that means. He also said that the smallest mark would not pass from the Torah until heaven and earth pass away and all is fulfilled. Obviously, all is not yet fulfilled. Heaven and earth remain and our conquering king has yet to come. Mashiach ben Yosef was sent to prepare God's people for his, turn, his return by doing this. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives just as Messiah loved the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself as Messiah ben David a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that he should be holy, she should be holy without and without blemish. Luke twenty one thirty three, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. May we be counted worthy to stand before our King in that day.